where did the band go? Weren't they great? And wouldn't it have been great if instead of all that, he had just said, and now Russ Stark and his all-girl band. <laughs> now, I do have to say while I'm finding my scripture, because Annie Armstrong was marking my spot earlier and I took her out. Um, as big a fan as I am of cowbell, I really like to hear flute. So I pr promise I'm coming back. I'm going to bring bicycles and kayaks and my wife and have a wonderful time here. But when we come back to worship again, I want you all to do that same thing, uh, my all in all. But what I want you to do the next time, where's our flautist? There you are. While they're playing what they're playing, I want you to play Pachelbel's Canon in D. They go together really, really well. And put a mic on her, because it'll be wonderful. As, as has been said, I am from Virginia which, and Richmond, which is the capital of the South. If you have your Google Maps out, if you draw a line directly east from here, that's the South I'm from. So I'm the South that's due east. Um, and I will give you a quick lesson. Uh, there may be, te are there any Texans here? Okay, I will, I will use little words. They keep coming, they keep coming back. You, you don't need this lesson, but I'll use little words anyway. Um. <laughs> in the South, in, in the English language, the second person singular pronoun is you. The second person plural pronoun is you. That is not precise enough for us in the South. So if I am talking to you, I say you. If I am talking to you and your family, I will say y'all. But right now, I'm talking to all y'all. <laughs> so if somebody comes up to you as an individual and says y'all, they're a pretend Southerner. Okay, and you call them on it. Now before we get, in, well, before we get into our scripture passage, I, I have one more disclaimer to say. Some of you walked in here this morning very casually and blasé. And I think some of you may have stopped appreciating how gorgeous a place you live in. This place is just drop-dead gorgeous. And we don't even have the, the leaves on the aspens or anything like that happening right now. And speaking of taking things for granted, you may feel the same way about your pastor. And I gotta tell you something, I, I follow him online. His sermons are out there, his devotionals are out there, and they genuinely bless my heart on a regular basis. I've had to dig a little harder to find them because he's uh, hiding from Facebook for Lent or something. Um, but I, I've, I found him out there. And they bless my heart, and I hope you do not take him for, for granted that maybe the way you take for granted how beautiful it is around here. And I will sum it up like this. You are blessed to have a pastor that is the closest thing you will find to a white Morgan Freeman. <laughs> and we know that Morgan Freeman speaks for God. Matter of fact, he occasionally is God. He's tall, he's whatever, and that, that voice. I, I can't do that voice. So please don't take either your surroundings, your fellowship, or your pastoral leadership for granted. Our scripture today comes from the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, starting with the 28th verse. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important answer, Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. 
May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. I am a big fan of, of nature, of God's creation, and I, I, I try to learn from it. I was sharing earlier down the road where I'm going to be going again shortly, um, going by there again on my way to Arizona, um, that as a young minister, I studied a lot of preachers, and I tried to be some of them for a while. I'm too short to be the next Billy Graham, um, and I had a friend who did an excellent Billy Graham already, so that was taken, uh, Spurgeon or whoever, whatever great um, preacher from the past, and God laid it on my heart that he hadn't called me to be them over again. He called me to be me, and for that I apologize right now. Um, and I started saying, well, well, what is me? And, and I, I studied one more preacher, a carpenter from Nazareth, and looked at his sermons, and he told lots of stories about nature, and about farmers, and about families. And so today, I just, I just want to talk with you for a few minutes, not in the brilliantly thought out, every word prayed over method of your pastor. I just want to talk. And I want to talk about something from nature that God has laid on my heart. I'm always fascinated when I read some uh, in National Geographic or something that they've figured out something about some animal. We know that it does this or it does that. Uh, from your time in the Pacific Northwest, I read a thing the other day that said the only ever accounts of a killer whale attacking a human being were in captivity. There are no accounts of a killer whale attacking a human being in the wild. I think y'all are safe here from, from that one. Um, so anytime I get a little nugget like that, I, I like to run with it. One of the best quotes I ever heard from a scientist about animals was at the Purina. Purina has some sort of go see all kinds of animals place in St. Louis. And if, they let, if you let them tell you to buy Purina products, they'll let you pat the animals. And I listened to the speech, and he told me why we should have Purina, that the scientists have said the ones that look like little chicken legs are better than the ones that our customer, that our um, competitors have. And he went through the whole spiel, and afterwards I went up to him and I said, seriously? He goes, between you and me, I've never seen a pack of wolves attack a wheat field. <laughs> So when you're, when you're seeing all the whole grains in your dog's food, remember, they've probably never attacked a wheat field either. But the animals I want to talk about today are geese. Now, I know, any golfers out there? Okay, I know you probably have a love-hate or just hate relationship with geese because uh, they find the ponds at the golf course and then they, they fertilize the course for you, so you should appreciate them for that. Um, but geese, there's, I'm going to tell you a few facts about geese today, and I want to see if we can make an application of geese to the church. The first thing I would tell you about geese is, geese know what they are doing. Geese do not to get, get together at the, the end of the summer and form um, little groups and breakout groups and bring in geese coaches and life coaches to say, this is what you should do next. When it's time to fly north, they all fly north. When it's time to fly south at the other time of year, it's time to fly south. And they're really good at it. They, they can get from a pinpoint spot in Canada to a pinpoint spot in the southern United States every year, back and forth, back and forth. I spent, it's a two hour drive roughly from Denver to here, and I spent the entire two hours yelling at Google because they couldn't get me from Denver to, to here very easily. But a goose can get from northern Canada to somewhere in Alabama and back regularly. So they've got the jump on us right there. And they know what they're doing. But what is the application of knowing your purpose and what you're doing to the church? And our scripture today, I think, nails that. What are we, the church, supposed to do? Love the Lord our God with everything we've got. And love our neighbors ourself. Now, I'm occasionally good at the first one. I'm rarely good at the second one. Because God defines my neighbor a lot more liberally than I want to. 
God has told me that some of my neighbors aren't very likable, or some very unlikable people God has told me are my neighbors. There's some people who are on the opposite side of the political spectrum from me that God has said are my neighbors. But my purpose as a Christian and as a part of the church is to love God with everything I've got and love everybody else the way I want to be loved. So the geese have a purpose, we clearly have a purpose. Well, how do they go about their purpose? The first thing I would tell you about geese is they work together. Now, my avocation is bicycle riding. I'm a little too old to say I'm a bicycle racer anymore. Uh, those days are, are in the past, but I love riding a bicycle. And when you ride a bicycle, there's a little known fact that if you let the person in front of you do all the work, you can sit behind them in an aerodynamic little draft and do very little work. And I do this as often as I possibly can. Occasionally I have to get to the front, but that, that person on the front is doing more work than the people in the back. And it's the exact same thing with geese. As they're flying along in the air, that goose at the front of the V is doing 30, 40% more work than any of the others behind him. Now, some of you, like me on a bicycle, are just sitting there going, yeah, I want to be the goose at the end of the line. Let that guy work out there. But they do something unique. And, and, I'm, and this is a Baptist church, I know, so I better be careful saying this. They rotate the leadership. They don't tell that one goose, you have to stay in front till we get to Alabama or till we get back to the Arctic. You get up there for a while and take a break, and somebody else will move into that spot. So they know their purpose, they've learned to work together, and they've learned to share the leadership. Now some of you being really good Baptists are thinking, yes, we have a system like that. Every seven or eight years we get another pastor uh, to sit on the front and do all the work, and we can sit back and, and just coast along. But I think the geese are telling us it's about all of us. We're all supposed to take our turn at the front. We're all supposed to be the strong one for a while and then go to the back and take a break. Now, one of the fascinating things, the next fact about them, and I, again, I don't know how the scientists figure this stuff out, but I'm going to trust them. When you see a V of geese going over, you've usually heard them before you saw them. You know, honk, 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 honk. They tell us that the honking comes from the geese in the back of the V. And they are encouraging the geese at the front that are working harder. Okay, let that settle in for a minute there. Okay, they know their purpose. They work together. They rotate the leadership. And when they're not doing all the work at the front, they're doing everything they can to encourage the ones in the front who are. So when you hear those geese honking, that's, hey, go get them. You're doing great. Keep it up. I love what you're doing. Even though I'd probably do it differently. I love what you're doing. Now, the last thing that I would tell you about them, and there's a whole bunch of facts about geese. They're out there. You can look them up. But the last thing that happens with geese, and probably the one fact all of us knew before I got here this morning to drag you down the land of geese, was that geese mate for life. They're very faithful. They're among the most faithful animals in God's kingdom. When a goose is injured, or sick, or damaged, or broken in some way, the spouse will stay with them even if the flock has to leave. And not only will the spouse stay with them, an extra goose will stay with the two of them. Now what's the point of that extra goose? You can't have a V with less than three geese. So a perfectly healthy goose who would rather be heading to the, to the uh, warm climates for the winter, will stay behind while that broken goose is healing. And when they're ready, the three of them will fly off and they can do exactly what all the other geese are doing. They're going where they're supposed to be going, they're working together, they're rotating the leadership, they're encouraging each other. What a lesson for the church. It has been said that the church is the only army in the history of mankind that shoots their own wounded. 
How many people do you know personally that probably are out of church right now because there was some bump in the road of their life and they either didn't feel like they could share it with their church family or they felt they would be judged by their church family and they stay away. When we are hurt, when we are sick, when we are broken, the one place on earth we should run without hesitation is to the body of Christ. So that our brokenness, our sickness, our whatever it is, can be healed. And when we regain our strength, we have people around us to help us bring us back in. These birds have the brain, a brain the size of a walnut, and not a very big walnut. But I've learned so much from them. I'm hoping today some of you are learning something from them. They know their purpose. Our purpose, simply, love the Lord our God. Love each other the way we want to be loved. We learn to work together regardless of whether we like a particular kind of music and they like another kind of music. We still have the same Lord and Savior. And that should be a bigger thing. We can work together no matter our differences. We can rotate the leadership around, and I'm, I'm seeing a few ragged faces that have been leading for a while, and some of you may need to step up and say, let me help you carry that load for a little while. They encourage each other. They encourage each other. Yeah. Life might be a struggle, but, but brother, you're, you're getting through. Sister, you're getting there. Anything I can do to help, you just let me know. And lastly, when we're broken, when we're hurt, when we can't do what we're called to do, we as the family should come together and draw those people in and help heal the brokenness. And then when the healing is done, to fly off to what we're supposed to be doing. Friday, when I got here to meet my friend of five years, and we, he was vacuuming, well, he wasn't, um, he was sitting there pointing and telling Lynette, now over there a little bit, and, and, and don't forget to take the trash out. Um, he was very good at it, um, encouraging her right there. As, as we, he was honking, boy was he honking. Okay. As we were finally leaving to go, go to their house, we're, we're going in a, in a caravan. He's in, he's in the Jeep and she's in the Dodge and I'm stuck in the middle in my little rental car. And we got back out to the main road and I grew up in a place where directions to your house included turn off the hard surface road at, at wherever. Uh, we got back out there and I looked and the sun was setting. The sky was this beautiful color. There are these wonderful mountains everywhere. And just because God is good, he sent a V of geese to fly directly over this building. Now, I don't know if Lynette, if you saw that or not, or if you were just choking on the dust that our tires were kicking up, but just right out over there, I looked back and saw these beautiful geese flying over this church. And my prayer is that this body of Christ would know its purpose, would work together to achieve it, would rotate through, give people a break, would encourage each other at every opportunity, especially the ones working the hardest. And finally, to help each other bind up the wounds and heal the brokenness. When we do that, we're loving the Lord our God, and we're loving our neighbor the way we want to be loved. Could we pray together? Father, what a blessing it is to be in this place be in the presence of people who understand your goodness, your greatness, your healing, your forgiveness. We pray, Lord, that if, if there's something that we can learn from these birds, that you would teach us. Help us to be purposeful. Help us to be healing. Help us to be encouraging. We pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen.